Welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome to They See at Dartmouth, uh, South Asian Perspectives on the Big Green Experience. Um, this is a virtual event as part of our DAPA 25 lead up series. Um, we are really excited to have some awesome panelists with us tonight across different years um, who can share what their experiences have been like. Um, at DAPA 25, it's our 25th anniversary of the foundation of DAPA. Um, our on-campus celebration is May 3rd through 5th, and you will have the opportunity to connect with other alums and hear from amazing right. speakers like Sorry. George Takei and Helen Zia. Um, feel free to fill out a survey as this will help us with planning numbers. Um, and don't forget that hotel reservations are open now. So if you've been to reunions, you know that hotels. Yeah, I'm listening. Please do uh, make your hotel reservations uh, if possible. Um, our registration form will also be coming out later this month. So please keep an eye out for that. And if you'd like to volunteer, uh, please let us know. Um, just quickly, I wanted to share some community guidelines. This is meant to be a safe space for everyone to share and reflect and honor our lived experiences as AAPIs. Um, we know that the Asian community and South Asian community is extremely diverse. So our panelists today will be speaking about their own lived experiences, not necessarily um, making any generalizations about our communities as a whole. Um, but this is a space for us and we have permission to share our experiences. Please assume best intent when others are speaking and we encourage you to speak your truth and to use I statements. Our goal is to share vulnerability and tell our stories um, without causing any harm to others. So um, please be cognizant of providing space to everyone and please be intentional about using preferred pronouns. Um, if you have any thoughts, feel free to use the chat. Um, just to note that this meeting is being recorded. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to Chitra Nar Narasimhan, 92. Um, she is the first South Asian president of Alumni Council, and she's going to share um, some thoughts about her experience. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it is such a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, honestly, I don't think when I was at Dartmouth 30 years ago, I would have ever imagined that I would be at a Desi at Dartmouth event. It never would have really been in the realm of possibility for me to think about. So I'm excited to be here today. I went to a large public high school where there were no Asian or South Asian clubs. It wasn't a focus in the curriculum either. Everything I learned about my South Asian culture and history was from my family and my Indian community. So when I got to Dartmouth, I had no expectations around clubs or curriculum. I just didn't have any experience there. And truthfully, I was more about assimilating and showing how I was like everyone else, not how I was different. That being said, I have to admit, I was intrigued about the Asian Students Association, something that was never part of my high school experience and went to a meeting freshman fall. And as you can probably guess, the group was predominantly East Asian versus South Asian. Um, and so I did feel a little out of place, even though everyone was super nice and welcoming, um, I didn't see necessarily a place for myself. So I never really found a South Asian community at Dartmouth. There were definitely students directly from India when I was in school that did seem to form one, but their lived experience was different from mine as I grew up in America. In retrospect, I wish there had been a way for us to connect as a community. Maybe we would have found our shared experiences and those bonds could have been strengthened over time. Fast forward 30 years and I see progress versus my own time as a student. But of course, there's always more that can be done. As you may have seen in my bio and Sarah just mentioned, I joined the Alumni Council about three years ago. It's been a great opportunity to get to know alumni from across the decades and to be more closely in touch with the happenings of the college. But now even in that group, there were only two South Asian representatives during my three year term, myself and another. But I have to say that I was happy to be there, happy to have my South Asian voice just and my voice in general to be part of the council. And I was proud to serve as its president last year. If you are interested, by the way, in the Alumni Council, please feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to tell more talk more about it. One of my greatest moments recently happened during our fall Alumni Council meeting last October. 
We happened to be on campus when the students from Shanti were setting up for Diwali. I cannot tell you how much excitement I felt seeing this. I went to meet the students as they were setting up and I joined in the Dia lighting celebration later on the green and even brought some of my fellow alumni counselors with me. It was great to see students dressed up in Indian clothes, lighting sparklers and celebrating South Asian culture. There were religious observances and a community dinner. Um, in fact, Provost David Coates told me it was one of his favorite events of the year. This would have never happened when I was a student. And to see this now, students, not just South Asian students, but students from all different backgrounds, sharing the beauty of South Asian culture, I was truly overjoyed. Um, it still makes me kind of tear up thinking about it. And honestly, a forum like the one today would also never have been part of my Dartmouth experience. So I am thrilled it's happening, and I look forward to the discussion this evening. Um, thank you so much for having me, and I'll turn it back to Sarah. Thank you so much, Chitra. Um, it's really great to see how far we've come over many years, and that's what we'll get into tonight, to tonight. Um, I'm going to pass it over to our moderator for tonight, Mayank Keshavia97. Um, he's a Los Angeles-based alum who's worked on Wall Street and internet startup and also a healthcare technology company, elementary school teacher. He's had a lot of uh, a lot of roles, which is awesome, but he's also a playwright. Um, so please welcome Mayank. He's going to share a little bit about himself in the chat, and um, he's going to introduce our other speakers. Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. So glad you could join us. You know, really happy that we're having this event, as uh, Chitra had said, you know, I definitely wouldn't have imagined something like this, even when I was a student, you know, in the late 90s, and, you know, maybe some of you who were at Dartmouth in the early 2000s or 2010s might also be glad and surprised that, you know, we've come this far, so let's keep the momentum going. Um, so in uh, moderating tonight, I wanted to kind of talk about a few different things, you know, the South Asian experience in a lot of different ways, but before we get to that, Let's meet the people who will be sharing their experiences with us. Okay. The first of those is Amish Badasher. He is the uh, CEO of the Explorers Lab, a boutique global venture lab specializing in deep tech business opportunities. He was previously a founding partner at a public company, global VC firm, a director of innovation at an R&D lab, and also co-founded a $100 million exploratory venture capital fund. He earned two degrees from Dartmouth College and a graduate degree from the University of London. When he's not collaboratively exploring the future, he enjoys exploring the San Francisco Bay Area with his wife and children. Um, our second panelist, Amrita, I'm sorry, Amrita Shankar, is a proud second generation Indian American. Amrita has worked at the intersection of finance and responsible investment for over a decade now and focuses on environmental social governance factors with a particular interest in how diversity in the workplace can enhance value. She earned a BA in government and minor in public policy at Dartmouth and also holds an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management with a concentration in finance. At Dartmouth, she served as a representative of the Pan-Asian Council and was a student body vice president. She's also the alumni representative for the class of 2012. Okay. The third panelist is Surajam Shondi. Surajam is an asylee from Bangladesh and currently resides in Lenape, colloquially known as Harlem, New York City. They received their BA in Gender and Sexuality and was a Race, Migration, and Sexuality Scholar and Eric Eichler Healthcare Leaders Fellow. After graduation, they received the prestigious Lombard Public Service and collaborated, I'm sorry, yeah, the Lombard Public Service and collaborated with Partnership to End Gendered Islamophobia and the Palestine Feminist Collective. They currently work as a youth advocate at Sakhi, where they provide trauma informed advocacy to youth, of youth survivors of gender based violence. They also organize with South Asian and Muslim queer collectives in New York City to cultivate intergenerational healing. And last but not least, Krishna Desai, a Tech 21, is currently the Director of Business Development and Strategic Investments at the NFL. She attended the Tech School of Business at Dartmouth from 2019 to 2021, where she co-founded Next 50, a student-led program that shed light on representation in the curriculum. Krishna has over a decade of experience in sports media and corporate strategy at top media companies from Snapchat to NBC Sports. As an avid sports fan, she's spent a lifetime rooting for the Knicks and gravitates towards just about anything that involves a ball on the score. Today, Krishna lives in New York City. So having introduced our panelists, let's ask them each, in terms of introducing their experiences at Dartmouth, 
If there were any places at Dartmouth that they felt that they could connect with their identities or they felt like they couldn't connect and you know how those experiences kind of impacted their lives beyond Dartmouth. So why don't we just go in the order that I introduced you also, Amish, would you mind starting? Sure, it's a great question. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, and thank you, Mayank, for the for the expert moderation here. Um, also wonderful to scroll through the chat window and or the participant window and see so many familiar names. So th th welcome to all of you. Um, th th there were a few places. Um, as a kid, I like to take things apart and maybe as an adult, I like to build things. And so the, the, the jewelry studio, the wood shop and the machine shop at their school were all places that felt a little bit um, more like home to me. And I'll leave my answer short and at that, but thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, go ahead, uh, Amrita. Uh, I feel like this is low hanging fruit, but Collis was very much my home on campus between <laughs> all of the baked goods and the mozzarella sticks at late night, that was where you would readily find me. But in seriousness, I think also I when I think of any cultural event or affinity on fence on campus, I feel like Collis was very often the mainstay. And uh, being able to bring people on campus together to celebrate their interests felt a place where I could appreciate my own identity and also relate to the identity of my peers and friends as well. Awesome. Thank you, Amrita. Um, so Roger, what about you? How did you feel like space on campus helped you or maybe didn't help you connect your identity? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for the question. Um, I think um, two of the places that really felt like home for me was the Tucker Center and the Opal Office. For those who are not familiar with the abbreviation Opal, it's Office of Pluralism and Leadership on campus, and mostly because they had really comfy couches to nap on. So I would just nap there in between meals, in between classes, um, do work. Um, yeah. So those were places where I felt connected. Um, yeah, I don't, I can't think of any place where I didn't feel connected. Maybe like the really quiet spaces in the library where no one would talk. Awesome. Thank you, Sirajan. Um, and Krishna, same question. And, you know, before you go, I love the fact that we've gotten so many diverse answers from our panelists. So go ahead. Yeah. So I think mine's going to be not campus centric, but there was a WhatsApp group chat that was started as when I got into talk. So um, I'm a, I was a talk 21 and there was a lot of conversation right away. And it made me feel like I had like an immediate group that I could gravitate towards if and when I ever needed it. Um, and I certainly found myself doing that over the course of those two years. Awesome. Awesome. So we both have tangible spaces and virtual spaces. You know, we connected so many different ways today. So with that, thank you all for you know, introducing yourselves and for kind of giving us a entree into this conversation. When we all thought about, you know, how can we pre present this panel, what would be most meaningful and how we were talking about it, the way things kind of evolved was that there were kind of certain themes that came about, or maybe I might call them, you know, avatars or avatars from the Sanskrit of incarnations of the ways Dartmouth incarnated in our lives. And so the first of those four or let me kind of give you the overview. So we talked about social, cultural, political, and academic kind of experiences that we all had throughout our lives. So kind of starting with the first of those, social experiences might include anything from, for example, you know, friend groups, international students versus American-born students, or how much we want to assimilate into Dartmouth versus, you know, or into South Asian culture or events on campus versus staying more mainstream, issues of caste and class. Um, friend groups, post-graduation alumni networks, you know, undergrad versus graduate experiences and how much support there was for those things on campus. So social encompasses a lot, but I'd like to kind of focus on a few of those things that are very relevant to our panelists' experiences. So Sirajam, I'll start with you. If you might kind of give us a foray into this with your experience kind of as an asylee on campus, and then also speak to your experience with the Grad Student Support Network after that. Absolutely. Um, yes. So I applied to college um, as an asylee. Well, I was seeking asylum at the time. My asylum status was pending. So I applied as an international student because that was the only like two op one of the two options that were available to me. The other one was applying as a U.S. citizen. So very early on into my Dartmouth journey, like I felt like I had to like choose between these two camps that I was not part of. And that started 
like very early on um, starting with orientation when I had to like choose whether to go to the international student orientation or the one for the domestic students. And I remember being really confused because I had no idea like which information would be relevant to me um, because I was not on a visa. So some of the, you know, programmings that were um, offered to international students on campus wouldn't apply to me um, and vice versa. So it took me a lot of um, time to like figure out like my place at Dartmouth, both in terms of like, you know, like literally like what boxes do I check? And also like in terms of finding a sense of community. Um, and as Chitra was sharing earlier about like finding folks with, with whom I can like share lived experiences. I moved to the US at 14 and I um, finished high school here. And a lot of my peers either grew up in the US or they grew up um, abroad and moved to Dartmouth for college. And that was their first interaction with the US. So it was really difficult, even in terms of like pop culture references or um, even like language access uh, before coming to Dartmouth. My, I only spoke in Bengali um, most of the time when I wasn't in school. And at, da at Dartmouth, that definitely took a hit because I could not find anybody else who like spoke my dialect and fluent in Bengali. And um, as you all know, we don't offer Bengali language mm -hmm. courses either. So it it took me a while to orient myself for sure. And I think the international, um, the graduate student community was really impactful for me to find a sense of home because there were a lot of graduate students who were, um, coming from uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan and India. And um, I really took a liking to the sh uh, the shared spaces, specifically at Al Noor, the Muslim Student Association, because it would all, we would all come together over food and um, shared stories um, and lived experiences that we could talk about. And I really, really um, appreciated their support. Um, and as an undergraduate specifically, like it was just really warm um, and nice to have like this, you know, um, folks who are a few years older than me who had lived a little bit more than me um, have kind of not just like hold spaces for me, but also like feed me um, and like, you know, take me shopping. Like the, those are the things that they like really, really offered. They were like, oh, like, let's, let's like go buy these like desi snacks from like um, this grocery store. So I think those things I really um, connected with grad students at a level, uh, surprisingly, like um, then with my undergraduate peers uh, at the time. Got it. Thank you. And, you know, I really appreciate kind of your answer to that question, because so often, you know, people like me, for example, who often thought of, you know, there's the international students and there's the American born students. And, you know, there's obviously a spectrum in between and you kind of made it a non-binary and complicated that. And I really appreciate kind of the way you've kind of opened up that experience with your own lived experience about how, you know, to think about that and, you know, how many other ways in which Dartmouth can be experienced. So. Um, thank you, Sid Aldrum. And you talked about, you know, grad students going from undergrad and then, you know, finding support within grad students, but then the sort of next evolution of social interactions is what happens after graduation. And so let's move on to Krishna. Maybe you can talk a little bit about kind of what you, your experience has been with support of South Asians in the workplace, you know, beyond Dartmouth, where those relationships and those social structures that we built in college kind of move to the next level and how they evolve and change beyond that. Yeah, I think the post graduation experience has been particularly interesting. Um, I work in an industry that has very few people like myself, um, and that might be true for a lot of minorities in the room. That's not like a unique experience to me. But one of the things that strikes me, and I'm going to call on Chitra's answer a little bit, we really have come quite a long way. Maybe we couldn't have even imagined a, a scenario like this 20 years ago or, or even fewer than that. I think one of the things I remain optimistic about is that we continue to expand that relationship with the workplace, um, particularly in mind trim and sport. And I, I maybe I chose the uphill battle and maybe that was part of the reason I really enjoy it. Um, just being like the 
against the grain a little bit, but I, I will say I, I have South Asians at work that I know that I really can't call on, right? And so one of the things that makes me uh, optimistic about this experience and future experiences is having the ability to call on those people. So I intend to put that burden on me, at least in part. And I hope that uh, for folks on this call that we take that, this is a little bit of a call to action to do that, um, which I'm hopeful to do, right? I think, I think we all probably know this. Asians make up more than half of the world's population. And oftentimes in work ERGs, we get bundled into one group, which is kind of a shame because there's such diverse experiences across East, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia independently. So I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, and um, that's one thing that I'll definitely take with me for into the future, Dartmouth and beyond. Awesome, thank you, Krisha. And you know, one thing I loved about kind of both your answers is this process of finding community. You know, for Sid Adram, it was with grad students who would take you shopping or take you to buy snacks. For Krishna, it's about, you know, using even venues like this way after graduation to kind of find that support that you don't have in the workplace. So. You know, while at Dartmouth, I'm sure many of us were seeking community, seeking connection, and we continue to after the fact. So I'm hopeful that for many of us, this will be this and our event next year will be an opportunity to solidify those bonds and further kind of find connection and ways to support each other. Yeah. Um, as, sorry, go ahead. I was just say, luckily, I don't have a lot of complaints about the talk South Asian like groups. We were great. We had a good relationship. And I wish I'd met Sarajam at school because apparently the grad schools were great to her and we were on campus at the same time. <laughs> Maybe in the future. That's right. Well, connecting late is better than never, right? Okay. So um, to kind of segue from, you know, social experiences to cultural experiences, I'll ask uh, Amrita to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, her experience on campus through the lens of kind of being part of sort of what's considered a model minority as well as her experiences kind of with Pan-Asian Council on kind of diversity in the student assembly. So that kind of bridges the gap between kind of social aspects at Dartmouth, but also being involved in cultural or student organizations while on campus. So if you wouldn't mind uh, speaking from your experience, go ahead, Amrita. Of course, no, thank you, Mayank. I was, I was struck by your comment about community because especially where we are in the world, uh, post COVID, if we can call it that, I think, that's something I've been thinking a lot about and reflecting on how do we create community and uh, those bonds that feel so important. Um, I'll speak to my uh, Dartmouth experience. I mean, uh, being an 18 year old in the middle of New Hampshire is a wild experience, right? Where you come on campus and I don't know, Sirajam, if they still had these t-shirts, but when I got off for trips, uh, there was someone from H crew who had this shirt that said Dartmouth equals Hogwarts plus Disneyland. And it was, and it was, and it was meant to be, I think this catalyst for the, this idea of Dartmouth that is magic and rainbows and people with brightly colored hair, like dancing in the lodge and welcoming you to this really, you know, diverse quirky community. And it's, it's interesting when I think of my four years on campus, because uh, I have made some of my closest friends on campus for sure, but also it, it, it can be a cha challenging place to also find your identity. I was struck by Chitra's remarks earlier because I also grew up in, uh, a, in a small town in Connecticut where there were 10 people of color in my graduating class. So when I came to Dartmouth, I thought that the South Asian, ex I, I thought that I would have more of an entree into South Asian experience on campus. And I, I feel like I know so many of my friends and peers who still felt like they were inhabiting this role of model minority. So I'm sure we have friends like this who, you know, wanted to be econ majors, saw this as, uh, you know, saw this as the route to, right, like upward, so, upward economic trajectory. Um, and also for me, you know, my parents didn't go to college in the U.S. So I was figuring out how do you think about majors? Like, how do you navigate corporate recruiting? How do you think about all of these things, which for some of my friends who um, had parents who went to Dartmouth and then certainly parents who went to colleges in the U.S., I think had at least an idea of what the college experience would look like. Um, I think from that, uh, some of my friends have been wildly successful post-graduation, but I do feel like anxiety really played a big role in you know their time on campus. And so mental health was a huge issue. Uh, and also this idea of assimilation. So I came thinking to college that I would find a lot of people that were excited to celebrate their South Asian identity. And I think there were folks who felt that too, but also the pressure of many folks who felt like 
they had to have a more a mainstream experience or in rushing a fraternity, they couldn't also celebrate their culture identity. Some of that, I think either if, uh, to Krishna's point, if you had good mentors or if you had an example of folks who'd carved a path out for that before, potentially that could have been somewhat alleviated. But if you didn't have those models, I think it could felt like you really had to assimilate to a culture of whiteness rather than realizing you can be this complex person who owns their identity, has unique interests and doesn't have to follow the mainstream path too. Got it. That's you know very well said. And just to kind of follow up on that. So once you were on campus and you know kind of what were the spaces that you found other organizations, whether it was Pan Asian Council or whatever else that allowed you to kind of feel that whole person, that more complex person, at least at times or in certain ways? A hundred percent. I give full credit to Nora Yasamura, who is has been a guiding light too to moderate this event. Um, also, one of my mentors from campus, Savana Hall, is also here. And I think um, it it feels so special to have an adult see you and really uh, nurture and guide you in a way where they say, yes, there are ways that you can flourish as your whole self. And really had Nora not seen me freshman year to say, you know, I think you'd be really interested in this. I don't know if it would have been so core to my identity. So freshman year, uh, Nora suggested that I be a representative for Pan-Asian Council. That led me to really think about a lens of how does diversity impact our college experience. And so while I, so I then uh, for student assembly was part of the Diversity and Community Affairs Council to say, how do we own our identity, but also liaise with other communities on campus? And that felt, that was such an eye-opening experience for me, especially coming from a small town, because I think it helped me appreciate, yes, you can you can own your own identity and be empowered to live that truth. And that doesn't detract from having curiosity and awareness of how other people celebrate their identity. Uh, there was someone my senior year who said, I think diversity is a verb. And I love that because it is this continual practice of understanding and appreciating differences while also you know, celebrating the the kindred values or the spirit that unites us. That's awesome. Thank you. Again, very well said. I love that diversity is a verb. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so turning from Amrita to Amish, you know, as a co-founder or founder of Shanti, uh, which is one of the South Asian student organizations on campus, perhaps you can provide your perspective on not only sort of trying to find your place amongst the existing organizations, but starting a new one. Sure, yeah. Um... Happy to, you know, to, to me, the, in, in preparing for this, the thing that struck me was how special a place Dartmouth is, right? It's, it, it would be relatively, I, I think, easy for me to get pissed off that there's no place of worship for Hindu students on campus or, you know, a, a, a dining hall for halal, the, the, you know, people who observe halal practices or, or vegetarian students doesn't exist, right? And just the, the, there's the, there's that road. Um you know, maybe more than 10 years earlier, but Nora was a mentor of mine as well. And uh, Professor Rega, who's on the call, was also a mentor of mine. And But both encouraged me to take action um, and and do something about that. And, you know, the, um, the, the there was no place of worship. It was certainly an uphill battle, right? Um, the, uh, the, the, the Rollins Chapel has been the way it's been for you know, decades, you know, and, and to make any changes to, you know, one of the storied institutions within Dartmouth is not always easy, right? But um, may, maybe that was a battle worth fighting, right? And that maybe that, um, maybe the, the, the Dean of Religious Life at the time, who was strongly opposed to making any changes, you know, was wrong. And, and, uh, you know, have, having the support of, of Professor Rega and Nora, um, certainly, and, and others on campus joining the cause, you know, made a small change, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm heartened to, when I visit campus to, to see what, how that's evolved since, right? Um, but, th you know, the lesson for me was, was pretty clear at that point, right? That, that there's, um, there's an opportunity uh, to be heard, there, there's an opportunity to make a difference, and, you know, I think in my professional career, that's probably served me fairly well when I, I um, see something that I think should be a little bit different to maybe put my head down and make a difference, right? Try to try to change it. And, it, you know, I think I fail more than I succeed at that. But um, at, at least in that one example that you gave, it was um, hopefully a little bit of a of a contribution that's that's lasted and certainly evolved far past what I could have envisioned to, to echo what Chitra started this call with. 
Excellent. Um, you know, point well taken. And if I could just ask you a quick follow up, you kind of mentioned some of the struggles of in terms of the administration or mm -hmm. Rollins and the existing structure of the Dean of Religious Life. Mm -hmm. But how was the organization kind of received from the student population? Like when, you know, obviously new store organizations pop up relatively frequently, but this one has lasted and this one is kind of different in nature than maybe some other student organizations. So how did students at the time respond to it? And how did the community kind of, of students respond to it, even those who are non Hindu and such? Um, yeah, I, I thought it was fairly well received at the time, right? Uh, Professor Prasad Jayanti, who's still there um, in computer science, right, uh, was was kind of the, the faculty sponsor. And I think one of the things that uh, enables continuity with any student organization is having either a long-term faculty member or a long-term uh, administrator kind of um, involved. Um, and, and so in, in, in the case of Shanti, there's there's clearly a faculty advisor that that's just, you know, been the same faculty advisor since day one. Um, I, I was heavily involved with the Winter Carnival. I was chair of the Winter Carnival for three of my four years at Dartmouth. Um, you know, it's all another lasting institution. You know, I, I think they, um, I, I think the, the student reception was, yeah, sure, another student club, right? Um, kind of, you know, a little bit more positive than neutral, but, you know, I don't think there are any fireworks going off, but um, it's, it's really amazing to, 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 you know, go on the Dartmouth website and see under, you know, under religious life and under the Rollins chapel to see, you know, see another, another entry on the list, right? Um, that, that, that didn't exist previously. Thank yeah. you. It's a very, uh, very Hamiltonian idea of build something that'll outlive you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, awesome. Thank you, you know, both you and uh, Amrita for your kind of observations and your experiences about kind of building cultural institutions, existing cultural institutions, how to take advantage of them, how to make change, you know, how to speak out. And, you know, I think that provides kind of a nice segue, making change and speaking out into sort of the political aspects of being South Asian at Dartmouth, um, which could include things like, you know, dealing with racism, dealing with microaggressions, anti-Asian hate, you know, lack of representation. Um, or, you know, even on a more personal level, being kind of vocally South Asian versus blending into the mainstream more and kind of just sitting back, you know, focusing on grades or career, or whatever the case may be. Um, so I'll start again with uh, Sirajam, if you wouldn't mind kind of talking about some of your activism, both at Dartmouth as well as post-college. Sure. Um, yeah, I Definitely, I think that in terms of political identity, like I became politicized at Dartmouth. Um, I went to high school in Brooklyn in a very diverse um, public school um, where it I did not realize and coming from Bangladesh, which is a Muslim majority country, I did not realize or see myself as necessarily South Asian or even Asian or Muslim. Those identities were like not things that stood um, out. And I think Dartmouth was the first place where they did. And very much so there were um, things I in every every spaces that I entered, like I couldn't like not think about those identities because of the lack of representation um, and also agency and power that students like me had on campus. Um, so I remember that one of those moments of politicize, politicization was freshman fall um, when we, um, one day I came back to my dorm room in McLaughlin and there was, so I had decorated my dorm room door with a lot of like, like cut out like uh, flowers and like rainbows and all these like pretty stuff and glitters. And um, the award asylee was there along with other things that I cared about. Um, and I um, saw that someone had written over with a marker on the word asylee, go back home. And I, it was also such like poor handwriting. Like I couldn't even make out what was written. I'm like, is this Arabic? Is this English? Like I can't tell. But once I figured it out, it kind of like sank into me that, oh, and as as this was happening, right? Like only two weeks before that, as um, Amrita was sharing, like during like orientation and the first days on campus, everyone's like, welcome home. This is where you belong, X, Y, Z. And like, you, so that the, the, the contradiction was really stark because of the timing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was a moment where 
I and because of how frightened that made me because this is literally my dorm room and not everybody has it's not a uh, public space right not everybody has access to that um and the lack of it, it really frightened me and the lack of administrative policies around it or action around it I think was that one of the first instances of politicization where I realized that okay no we have to keep each other safe and we have to take care of each other and like speak up about things that we see um mm -hmm. so it was very like natural for me to like get involved with organizing both on campus and off campus with um, issues that were um, relevant to me and my peers, everything from like um, organizing with survivors of sexual assault and violence um, to survivors of uh, hate violence and racism. Um, and I organized um, and co-founded the Palestine Solidarity Coalition, for example, uh, to uh, organize teachings and rallies to create, to have safe spaces where folks can talk about Palestine and liberation. Um, and understand and, uh, and draw the parallels between what's happening on campus versus around the world because Dartmouth can also be a bubble, right? Where you feel like the rest of the world doesn't exist or matter or impact what's happening um, inside Dartmouth and vice versa. Um, and then I organized um, uh, specifically in the South Asian context, um, rallies against Hindutva when um, the CA 